Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter 10, Sustaining Terrestrial Biodiversity, Forests, Public Lands, Grasslands, Wetlands, and Cities. Now, as I said in part one of this uh, lecture, uh, unfortunately, or again, fortunately, depending on how you see things, uh, there are three, going to be three parts to this lecture as there are uh, just over 90 slides. Uh, so part one spoke about forest and public lands. Here in part two, we're going to talk about grasslands and wetlands, and then part three, uh, we'll talk about cities. All right, so here we go, part two of my lecture on chapter 10, how can we manage and sustain grasslands? So methods to sustain the productivity of grasslands, we need to control the number and distribution of grazing livestock, and of course we need to uh, restore uh, degraded grasslands that are out there already. So uh, what is a rangeland? Uh, rangelands are unfenced grasslands in temperate and or tropical climates that supply forage or food for animals. Pastures are managed grasslands or fenced meadows used for graving uh, livestock. So pastures usually are fenced in, uh, usually owned by uh, maybe one farmer or one uh, someone who owns cattle, um, and that uh, their cattle then would graze in that pasture. Rangeland is usually either large private or large public lands uh, that are unfenced and again uh, supply an area for, um, for cattle and other livestock to graze. The problem is that m many of our rangelands are becoming overgrazed. So moderate levels of grazing actually healthy for grasslands as they can uh, kind of take a little bit of that of that grass out, uh, allow other um, other. Uh, creatures, other species of plants and animals to kind of grow and thrive there. But unfortunately, when you overgraze the rangelands, uh, then you lead to some major problems. Number one, it reduces the grass cover, which then compacts the soil, which lessens the ca uh, capability uh, for that uh, soil to hold water, then leads to erosion of that soil by water and wind. And then this promotes the invasion of invasive plant species that cattle won't eat right because they eat certain like to eat certain grasses certain plants uh, but when you change the soil composition uh, of, an, of, of a rangeland obviously invasive plants will come in uh, the cattle don't want to eat that and so now you have even bigger problems so this is basically a picture of what I'm talking about on the left is an overgrazed uh, rangeland again you can see what has happened here you now have just uh, basically soil that's left over that now erodes uh, by wind by rain um, and you notice nothing growing over here on the right is a uh, lightly grazed uh, rangeland and again um, you'll notice you still see the grasses and you don't see the soil right the grass Grasses are holding the soil in, which reduces the erosion, which uh, adds to uh, holding more water, which can then lead to more grass, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, even though this is fenced off, they are still considered rangelands because, again, uh, they are so vast on, on either side here. So again, just a kind of uh, visual of what we've been talking about uh, in the notes. So we need to manage our rangelands more sustainably. So how do we do that? Well. Uh, use something called rotational grazing, right? I'm sure you've heard of, of a crop rotation. Well, there's also a grazing rotation, which means move your cattle around regularly, right? And graze different areas of the gra of the rangeland um, at different times of years, et cetera, et cetera. Fence off damaged areas and let secondary secession kind of take over uh, and kind of rejuvenate those damaged areas. And then something called holistic herd management, which is uh, basically short-term transportation Sampling by moving herds can actually aerate the soil, which actually can help out because uh, it increases nutrient recycling and soil fertility by pressing decaying grasses into the soil. So um, what this means is don't necessarily let your herd graze in these damaged areas, but allow them to kind of move through rather rapidly, which cause the trampling to actually aerate the surface. Then you fence it off, leave it, and then let secondary secession kind of come in and uh, restore that rangeland. So what you're seeing here is an example of the, just that. So on the left here, um, this is the mid-1980s. This is the San Pedro River in Arizona. And you'll notice the cattle who have been grazing here for many, many years have degraded all the vegetation and the soil here on the banks of the river, right? So what are you seeing? Exposed soil that then gets eroded away by wind and rain, isn't able to hold moisture because it's, it's 
it, 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 it's compacted. Well, what they did here was they knew that this was a problem. And so they basically said, OK, we're going to prohibit grazing and off road vehicle. Those little ATVs, those uh, mountain bikes. We're going to limit or we're going to actually not even limit. We're going to um, we're going to ban. OK, uh, grazing and off road managed uh, off road vehicles in this area. And now look at what happened here on the right is the exact same river valley. Ten years later, secondary secession has caused it to rejuvenate. And now you have what it looked like before the cattle overgrazed it. So again, um, uh, something we can clap our hands about, right? This is a positive story. Uh, and that's the key. If you allow nature to kind of uh, regroup, uh, you can uh, deal with and mitigate some of these problems, right? By just banning the cattle and the off-road vehicles, it's nature, secondary succession took over. And within a decade, uh, you had the riverbank restored uh, of all its vegetation and its soil. Again, that's how it's done. All right, moving on. Let's talk a little bit about wetlands now. How can we manage and sustain wetlands? So remember, wetlands could be either inland wetlands or coastal wetlands. We talked about uh, this a bit more uh, or a bit in a previous uh, chapter. Wetlands are disappearing, right? The United States has lost more than half of its coastal and inland wetlands since 1900. Other countries have lost even more. And the rate of those uh, losing those wetlands throughout the world is unfortunately accelerating. So why? Well, again, we've talked about it. For centuries, people have drained, filled in, or covered swamps, marshes, and other wetlands for rice fields or other cropland to accommodate expanding cities and suburbs, right? To build more housing, to build roads, to extract minerals, oil, natural gas, um, and to eliminate breeding grounds for insects that cause disease such as malaria. So through history, we've done this to our wetlands. And now, unfortunately, we are seeing uh, those wetlands disappearing. So we need to preserve and restore our wetlands. Only about 6% of the country's remaining inland wetlands are federally protected, and state and local wetland protection is inconsistent and generally weak. Private investment bankers make money by buying wetland areas and restoring or upgrading them or creating new wetland. This creates wetland banks or credits that the bankers then sell to developers. So again, this is a way to uh, using money to use a monetary incentive uh, to help uh, restore our wetlands. However, wetlands are difficult to restore, enhance, or even to create wetlands. Uh, so as always, using that precautionary principle, when we begin to see the wetlands go away, we need to take Take action now and not wait until they have all disappeared because, again, they are difficult to restore. So a case study that the book talks about is the Florida Everglades, right? A huge inland wetland um, in southern Florida. To help preserve the Everglades system, in 1947, the U.S. government established Everglades National Park. However, this protection effort did not work because of the massive water distribution and land development project to the north. We'll talk about that in a second. Most of the original Everglades has been drained, paved, polluted by agricultural runoff, and invaded by invasive plant and animal species. So what they're talking about is this. Uh, this is right down here. This is southern Florida. This is your Everglades, okay? But what was happening is they were diverting water to the north here coming off of Lake Okeechobee for agriculture and for water conservation, right? Why? Because you have these urban areas right along the coast. If you've ever been there, Miami, Boca Raton, right? West Palm Beach, just up here. So we needed the water not only for uh, irrigation, for agriculture, but for the people that are the booming, right, population of along the southeast coast of Florida. So to make a long story short, this is Everglades National Park now, but if you look at the red, this was the original Everglades system, ran all the way up to Lake Okeechobee and all the way down uh, here into, so all of this here, Miami, et cetera, was part of the original uh, Everglades system. But again, because of water being diverted, uh, it basically dried up the Everglades and only left this little area down here. So again, that was made into a national park. Uh, so that that you can't develop there, but you can just notice how smaller the Everglades are now uh, compared to what they were before development occurred in southern Florida. So the Everglades biodiversity has been decreasing mostly because of habitat loss, pollution, and invasive species like we spoke about in the previous slide. About 90% of the wading birds in Everglades National Park have vanished 
In addition, populations of vertebrate, uh, vertebrates from deer to turtles are down 75 to 95 percent. So the world's largest ecological restoration project, known as the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, has been put into effect, and it has several ambitious goals. One, to restore the flow of the Kissimmee River that's coming out of Lake Okeechobee, removal of the canals and le levees that block the natural uh, water flows south of Lake Okeechobee so that they can return to the Everglades, that water, conversion of large areas of farmland, right, that agricultural area will convert it back to marshes, creation of 18 large reservoirs and underground water storage areas for the lower Everglades and South Florida's population. So now instead of using the Everglade waters, let's lose some aquifers or underground water storage to help uh, to help the folks there, the urban development, have their water. And building a canal reservoir system for catching the water now flowing out to the sea and pumping it back into the Everglades. So the idea is, as this continues, that the uh, that area of the Everglades will grow larger again. And again, that will create more habitat uh, for the biodiversity, the creatures that live there. And hopefully that will slow the rate of biodiversity loss and maybe even reverse it and start to see uh, the biodiversity increase again uh, along the Florida Everglades. So how can we sustain terrestrial biodiversity and ecosystem services? Well, we just started to talk about that a little bit uh, with the Florida Everglades Restoration Project. And now I'm going to give you some more examples of how this can be done. So number one, establish and protect wilderness parks, right? They made the Everglade National Park didn't allow any more development there, and that was at least the, the beginning uh, of the restoration phase. Identify and protect biological hotspots. What are biological hotspots? They are highly threatened areas of biodiversity. I'm going to show you a, 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 sh a picture on the next slide that shows you uh, where these uh, hotspots are around the globe. Protect our ecosystem services, restore damaged ecosystems, and share areas that we dominate with other species. Uh, We'll talk about those hot spots in a second. Uh, what else can we do? Map the world's terrestrial ecosystems and create an inventory of species. Identify resilient and fragile ecosystems, right? Resilient ones, maybe you can leave alone for now. Fragile ones, you need to go in and help. Protect the most endangered ecosystems and species, right? Emphasis should be on protecting plant biodiversity and ecosystem services. Again, restore those degraded ecosystems and provide incentives to landowners to not destroy their own ecosystems, give them money if they actually replenish or uh, refurbish some of these ecosystems. So strategies for sustaining terrestrial biodiversity, here are just some more. We need to protect species from extinction. Again, set aside wilderness areas that we no longer develop and, and go in and cut down trees, things like that. Establish parks and nature preserves where people can interact with nature. Again, if we interact with nature, uh, we may learn to love it a little bit more and therefore may be able to kind Kind of uh, uh, keep it uh, keep it well. Identify and protect those hot spots. Again, more on that in a second. Shift new development to lands already cleared or degraded. Right, that's not degrade anymore. If they have land already degraded, just use that for your for your development, your homes, your roads, your things like that. And obviously, as we said on the previous slide, impo uh, protect important ecosystem services. Increase crop product uh, productivity on existing crop land. So instead of finding more crop land, just increase the productivity on the cropland you have. Rehabilitate and restore partially damaged ecosystems. And again, share areas we dominate with other species, kind of uh, saying the same thing over again. All right, here are those hot spots we're talking about. We need to protect them. There have been uh, on planet Earth, as of now, 34 biodiversity hot spots that we have uh, honed in on. They only cover 2% of Earth's surface, but 50% of the flowering plant species and 42% of terrestrial vertebrates species on this planet live in this 2% of land that covers your 34 bio biodiversity hotspots. So again, we need to focus on this because this is where half of your flowering plant species are living and almost half of your terrestrial vertebrate species are living, right? So we need to protect these hotspots. There are also 1.2 billion people living in these hotspots. So that is uh, going to obviously hinder or, or not 
or not aid in the protection, right? It could make it a little trickier to protect these hotspots. And only 5% of the total area of these hotspots is actually truly protected right now. So here are your uh, hotspots. I noticed one here in the Appalachian Mountains, kind of close to us here in Ardsley. Obviously, uh, we are not in a biological uh, biodiverse hotspot here in Ardsley, but you'll notice much of Central America, right? That's Costa Rica. We talked about that. Uh, you'll notice much of South, at least the uh, Western coast of South America. And then uh, here in uh, Brazil uh, and Argentina, got some hot spots here. You'll notice in Europe, some biological hot spots, Asia, Africa, a little bit in Australia. So again, the point is to really hone in on these areas and protect these areas. Because if you start here, obviously we need to protect everything, right? But at least if you start with these uh, biodiversity hotspots, uh, you would save half of our flowering plant species and what, 42% are of our terrestrial vertebrate species as they are living uh, in these little areas. Again, about 2% of the total uh, coverage of planet Earth. So again, something to think about there. So one of the things is to establish wilderness areas, all right? So again, my advice, especially for the big test in May, obviously understand uh, these acts, the 1964 Wilderness Act. Uh, the U.S. government uh, may set aside undeveloped tracts of public land, but again, only 5% of U.S. land right now is protected as wilderness, and more than half of that is up in Alaska. So here in the base uh, continuous 48 states, uh, we don't have a lot of, uh, of uh, this wilderness area that has been that is being protected by the government. Uh, as our human population, ecological footprints expand, uh, obviously it is increasingly becoming increasingly more difficult to find uh, these places to actually uh, Again, it's, it's becoming more difficult uh, to find uh, areas to actually establish new wilderness areas uh, because right now we have people living everywhere because, again, the human population uh, continues to explode uh, like we spoke about um, in, in, in previous chapters. So. Establishing parks, other nature reserves can help as well. Again, there are wilderness areas, which are kind of large areas, and then there are parks and reserves, which are a little, uh, a little bit of a, of a smaller geographic area. So they, we do have more than 6,600 national parks in 120 countries. Most, though, however, are too small to sustain large animal species, and some are so popular that humans are actually degrading them. Uh, I always joke to my friends, I go hiking here in Harriman State Park, which is just across the river in Rockland County. And when I was uh, younger, your guys' ages, when we used to hike in the park, there was no one there, right? It would be maybe me, a couple of my buddies. We wouldn't see anyone. Nowadays, if you go park on a nice, uh, if you go to the park, Harriman, on a nice Saturday morning, uh, there are cars you can't even fit in the parking lot. There are cars lined up along the streets. I always joke to my friends that we should uh, uh, put a Cinnabon in somewhere up on the trail. We make a fortune with all these people that are that are now hiking the trails. While in a way that is good to get people out into nature, in a way it's bad because now you have so many human beings out on these trails that the trails are being degraded. There's some litter, right? Uh, uh, it's just, again, they're so popular that they actually uh, are doing harm to themselves. So something to think about. Parks in less developed countries have the greatest diversity, right? Because if you looked at those hot spots I showed you, uh, most of them are in uh, less developed countries. Uh, and unfortunately, though, in those countries, you're subject to illegal poaching, logging, mining, and other uses uh, that it's tough for those less developed countries to enforce uh, there are any national park laws or things like that. So again, uh, more to think about, more that makes this, again, more difficult than it sounds. Again, what are our stresses on the U.S. public parks? The U we here, we're here in the United States have 59 major national parks, but what are degrading those parks? Popularity, like I just spoke about. Off-road vehicle use like ATVs and mountain bikes, cell phone towers that need to be put in, invasive species that are moving in, nearby air pollution and traffic, right? And overdue maintenance and repairs. It all comes down to money. Uh, usually the park service is on the lower end of our uh, United States budgets, right? So um, again, uh, there's maybe maintenance and maybe repairs uh, that are just overdue. So what we need to do is design and manage nature reserves. So large nature reserves typically sustain more species and provide greater habitat diversity than smaller reserves. Again, you got the wilderness areas, then you got these reserves, and then you got smaller parks. 
Habitat corridors, however, can benefit species. This allows migration in response to climate change. So what is a habitat corridor? Well, let's say, remember we spoke about you fragment a forest, right? You build a logging road through a forest and now you have two forests over here. Well, one of the things we can do is go in there and make a little connecting area of forest to connect the two fragmented forest areas. This is called a habitat corridor and will allow species, uh, creatures to be able to migrate through that to get from one forest area to the other that, of course, we uh, originally fragmented. Uh, so that is what a habitat corridor is. A buffer zone contact is to strictly protect inner cores of the reserve uh, and then a sustainable resource extraction in the buffer zone. What does that mean? Well, basically think of a circle, right? Uh, think of a bullseye. You have the inner circle and then you you have outer concentric circles around it, right? So the buffer zone concept says, okay, we have this nature reserve in that middle, that bullseye, no one's going in there, right? We're strictly protecting that inner inner core. You're not going in there. You're not hiking. You're not biking. You're not, that's just protected. Then maybe in the outer, one of the outer rings, right? So the first ring, maybe you allow human beings in there. Maybe you allow some off-road vehicles. Then maybe in the Outside in the when the widest ring, maybe you allow some mining there, or maybe you allow some some timber to be uh, extracted, some resource use, right? So basically, you have this large reserve in the middle, no one touches. A little bit further out, you get some activity, and then further out is where you do most of your extraction of resources and etc. This is then a buffer zone which keeps the inner part preserved and increases and keeps your biodiversity intact. So again, these are just some examples of how you can design and manage nature reserves. So Science Focus 10.1 speaks about reintroducing uh, the gray wolf into one of these parks, Yellowstone National Park, right? So between 18 1950 and 1900, the number of gray wolves declined because they were being killed by humans because gray wolves ate sheep, right? They came in, destroyed livestock, so human beings just hunted them down. Uh, in 1996, uh, 41 gray wolves uh, were relocated. They were caught in Canada and relocated to Yellowstone. In 2014, we now have 104 wolves in Yellowstone National Park. So again, uh, they were almost all gone. They relocated uh, a few of them caught in, in Canada in, this, in the same type of environment, right? Move them down to Yellowstone, uh, and now we're beginning to see the gray wolf population increase and there is a picture of that of that little guy that gray wolf in Yellowstone National Park Another case study here talking about Costa Rica once again. So we spoke about Costa Rica um, in part one. Now we'll talk about it in part two. Again, Costa Rica protects a larger portion of its land than any other country. Uh, its principles of biodiversity in the country, they respect biodiversity and understand the value of sustaining it. They rely less on fossil fuels and more on direct solar energy in Costa Rica. And they place a value on those ecosystem services and help implement full cost pricing. So again, Costa Rica... Uh, is a worldwide leader in e ecological conservation. They have mega reserves. These are large conservation areas designed to sustain 80% of the country's biodiversity. Again, they have a protected inner core surrounded by two buffer zones that local people can use. And again, they realize that they can make much more money in their eco tourism industry than by cutting down or, or destroying um, their, their, their terrestrial biodiversity here. So you'll notice uh, this is Costa Rica. Most of the land are these natural national park lands with, again, the buffer zones. In the buffer zones is where humans play and enjoy. In the green here, the parkland, uh, totally, uh, that's where the animals live, totally protected. And again, they are a, a leader uh, around the globe in, in, in actually doing this. Um, so how do we continue to protect our ecosystem services? Identify highly stressed life raft ecosystems like those biodiversity hotspots. Uh, areas with high poverty levels tend to have this. Most people depend on ecosystem services for survival. Residents, public officials, and conservation scientists should work together for that win-win principle of sustainability to help us all. Some of these examples of how we've restored damaged ecosystems around the planet, replanting forests, reintroducing our keystone native species to those areas, removing the harmful invasive species, removing dams. We'll talk about uh, in a couple of chapters about water resource use, but dams really are not great for the ecosystem. And of course, restore grasslands, coral reefs, wetlands, uh, and stream banks using the ideas we had before. 
Here are your four-step strategy, uh, strategy, strategies for carrying out rehabilitation. Identify the cause of the degradation. Stop it by eliminating or sharply reducing those factors. Reintroduce the keystone species if possible. And then obviously protect from further uh, degradation. So another way, sharing areas we dominate, right? Reconciliation ecology. What does that mean? That means invent and maintain habitats for species diversity where we live, work, and play. So instead of creating parks or wilderness areas where we, we aren't, we should use reconciliation ecology and actually invent and maintain habitats right here, right where we live, right? To help uh, increase and to maintain that biodiversity. We can uh, use community-based conservation, plant gardens as food for bees, butterflies, and other pollinators, eliminate or reduce pesticide use, and provide nesting boxes for birds in your backyard. What else can you do to help uh, sustain uh, terrestrial biodiversity? Plant trees and take care of them, recycle paper and buy recycled paper products, by sustainably produced wood and wood products and wood substitutes. Again, we've talked about this before. It sounds like a broken record, but obviously it's very important if you keep hearing it over and over again. Help restore a degraded forest or grassland yourself uh, and landscape your yard with the diversity of native plants. All right, that concludes uh, part two of my lecture on chapter 10, Sustaining Terrestrial Biodiversity. Again, make sure to check in for part three, where we will talk about cities. And as always, I thank you for listening.